Well, thank you, Ellen, for organising this and uh, thanks to everyone for coming and thank you particularly to Bill for presenting at what I think this is the last of the, so, well, in fact, Ellen just told me, so I know this is the last of the um, Chipstam seminars this year. Um, so I, I am have been kind of asked to chair, which is fantastic. And I will just very quickly introduce Bill, who is one of our own here in Aberdeen. He's the head of accountancy at the University of Aberdeen Business School. Um, and he came to us after um, spending time a bit further south in the central belt at Heriot Watt and Edinburgh universities. Um, like actually quite a few accountants, account, people in accountancy and in business schools. He's actually also a historian in that his research ties to the history of accounting and he's currently working on histories of accounting and healthcare the, um, and the social history of accounting. Um, his PhD was on the finances of the UK's voluntary hospitals and he's published on that subject and other sort of aspects of the history of hospitals and medical audit. So very much his interests tied to those of this group. Um, and he's currently working on a history of uniform accounting and record keeping in British hospitals. Um, and this work is part of that project. So I look very, so over to you, Bill. Many thanks, Andrew. That, uh, it's, it's an absolute delight to be here. I will uh, just try and share my screen and can everyone see that? Yep, that's sorted. Great. OK. So um, as I say, lovely, lovely to be here and I've tried to come to as many of these things in the last uh, year or two as I possibly could, and they've been an absolute joy. I love to see the, the variety of things that we are, we're seeing in these uh, seminar, seminars, and it's it's great. It kind of revitalizes my own interest in, in what I'm doing and, and gives me different perspectives. So. So today uh, I want to talk really about uh, Florence Nightingale, which uh, probably seems like a, a slightly bizarre thing for an accountant to want to talk about. You know why? Uh, and I'll very briefly talk about why an accountant and why why accounting might be interested in in Florence Nightingale. And I'll just put that in the context of a a very tiny history of, of accounting uh, as a technology and look at how it fits with other calculative practices. Uh, and then I'll talk about the, the case itself and, and the protagonist, Florence Nightingale, but also one other individual who was very important. And, and then talk about the war and, and the, the Crimean War and then the Royal Commission that happened after the war and, and some of its outcomes. Uh, so just starting with that, um, uh, there is a perhaps a, a perception amongst the general public that when people write histories of accounting, they're probably talking about um, histories of accountancy firms and, and public accountants and things that accountants do like audit and so on. And I, I can assure you that those of us that have, have explored these things, and my colleague Alec Arthur is here also, will be able to confirm this, that, that there is nothing more boring than that. Uh, unless you're actually doing contemporary accounting research, uh, which is even more boring. So. Most most accountants uh, in the UK are, are involved in, well, I've seen most, probably a, a large numbers of accountants in the UK are involved in slightly more critical projects of accounting, looking at uh, how accounting affects wider society and civilization. And it's really uh, important to note that accounting is, is something that's been around really as long as human civilization. And, and this picture here is is a picture of uh, Mesopotamian token accountings. Uh, and these these things were representative of goods and trade, and they were around really before there was a writing system. And when we did eventually uh, in human civilization get a writing system, it was also accounting. Uh, Proto-cuneiform is largely record keeping. And if we can follow this pattern, uh, that there's extensive evidence of accounting throughout the ancient world and throughout human civilization. It's, it, seems to be to some extent intrinsic to, to human organization. And as we come more into the modern period, we've got people like the, the Marxian economist Werner Sombart, who posited that double entry bookkeeping was a, an essential precursor to capitalism. And that obviously his his uh, theorem there caused a, a storm of interest in, in amongst accounting historians and people still work on that to see whether or not it really was an antecedent and 
you know, when did capitalism start? When did double entry start? All, all this kind of stuff. Um, that was perhaps initially interesting, but it's become a little bit boring as well, in, in my view. Um, later on, people like uh, Alfred Chandler pointed to the importance of accounting, the, you know, the business historian Chandler pointed to the importance of accounting to the rise of complex modern organisations. And uh, that's, that's another theme that has infused uh, accounting research. But it's not really all about business and it's not all about, you know, commercial and business activities. Mm -hmm. And uh, from the 1980s onwards, so there was a, a sort of theme in research that started to develop called the new accounting history, where people beca began to become a bit more interested in the programmatic nature of accounting and in the ways that, you know, the accounting programs could influence behaviour, could structure organisations and, and so on. And the social context of accounting really became central to that. And within that, the research arena expanded to encompass more than, more than perhaps uh, people would normally recognise as accounting. It, it expanded to accommodate other forms of calculative practice. And uh, it included a, a really diverse range of settings and, and the, the, the limits to what we can research in accounting now is, is really boundless. And it's very exciting and very interesting. I had a PhD student a few years ago who came to me with a, a proposal. He wanted to do a, a, a PhD on an international reporting standard. And I said, honestly, I would rather chew my own leg off than, than be involved in this. And they said, oh, OK, what should I do then? I said, well, why don't you go away and think about what you're interested in? And he came back to me the next day and he said, I really like popular music. And I said, that's great. It's a big industry. It's a big, you know, big commercial concern there as well. Why don't you think about doing something in that? So he, he spent a lot of time researching um, the 1960s and 1970s popular music, looking at the production of it, the role of accounting in that. He spoke to record producers up and down the country and, and had a great time. He really had a great time doing it. And so often our motivation for these things is quite selfish because accounting can potentially be very boring. So <clears throat> the research arena expands out and encompasses lots of lots of different things. Really, I, I, I'm of the opinion that anything that you're interested in, we could find an accounting angle to it. And uh, in some areas like the social history of medicine, we have we've started to colonize that as well. And we're looking at looking at it in a similar way to the, the kind of development of the social history of medicine by people like Brian Abel Smith with his seminal 1964 work on the hospitals and and then William Bynum and Roy Porter, you know, throughout the 80s and 90s. Uh, and and so many other people, just too numerous to mention, you know, Stephen Cherry, Virginia Berridge, all of these people massively developed the uh, the social history of medicine. And that to me is a really fascinating area and an area that's, that's deeply underexplored in relation to the, the kind of financial and calculative side of it and, you know, how numbers are used within the setting of medicine, within hospital context. And so I've spent probably 20 years now raking around in this stuff and, and just publishing not as much as I should because I find so many interesting things and keep drifting off on tangents. So in this one, we're looking at uh, Florence Nightingale <clears throat> and her involvement in the Crimean War and its aftermath. And there's there's a massive volume of material in this. The, the, the sources are just vast. And there's lots of secondary sources, of course. There's so many histories on the war, on Florence Nightingale herself. The biographies of, of Nightingale are numerous. They are of different quality, for sure. Uh, but there are many really, really good ones. And uh, now there, there isn't a more, in my view, at least a more authoritative to the source than uh, Lynn MacDonald's collected works of Florence Nightingale, which runs to 16 volumes. They're all about a thousand pages. It's an extraordinary achievement and just, just an incredible resource to have. Uh, equally, there are all the parliamentary reports and parliamentary documents that surround the war. There are newspaper reports from the time. And there's the writings of people like Florence Nightingale and uh, William Farr, who 
we'll meet shortly, and, and many others as well. So there's an extraordinary volume of material. I'm not as far into this project as I'd hoped at this point, but uh, it's uh, that's part of the reason there's just so much material to accommodate. So looking at the uh, protagonist and uh, really protagonists, uh, I think everyone knows who Florence Nightingale is. She was from an extremely well-connected uh, aristocratic family, uh, but personally she was somebody who rejected social conventions and wanted to do something useful with her life. Uh, her father trained her mathematically and she really made her reputation. She, she made her reputation a bit before the Crimean War, but really became a public figure uh, during and after the war. And she had uh, an, an association with uh, another individual, William Farr, who was really from the other end of the social spectrum. He was a farm labourer's son. Um, he had a benefactor who recognised his intellect and supported him through medical training, but as with many people in uh, in medicine in those days, he was unable to break through class barriers or, or even to break through the nepotism that existed in the, the voluntary hospital system and secure a hospital position. So he went off and he eventually became the Deputy Registrar General. The Registrar General was a, a sinecure position not really available to anyone who wasn't of the appropriate background but he was an extremely talented individual and was very, very uh, active in social reform. And so these two people uh, together are far from the cast of characters that are involved in this, but the constraints of space really limit me down to uh, down to these two. And, and actually largely I'll just talk about Florence Nightingale. So uh, how did they get together? Well, they met at dinner in 1856, and in the context of this particular case, he agreed to help her uh, with her com campaign to reform army hospitals and army medical practice. And she had wider ideas about the army uh, as well, and sanitation in the army more generally. And he agreed to, to help her structure the, the data and structure the information that she would use uh, as evidence. In return, she appears to have agreed to, to help him uh, in a similar project with the, the voluntary hospitals, the uh, civilian voluntary hospitals. And on that project, they, they later in 1858, at the, the National Association for the Promotion of Social Science, uh, Florence Nightingale delivered two papers in 1858. And they became the core of her later publication, Notes on Nursing. And they were very, very influential. Notes on Nursing is still in print and has been through so many editions. I don't think anyone's ever bothered to count them. It's just, just one of these perennial publications that has such enormous impact. And uh, their, their later attempt was to, to try and introduce a, a set of uniform hospital statistics that was designed clearly to create comparability amongst hospital performance and create particular visibilities where hospitals were underperforming uh, and so, so that there could be managerial interventions. I don't think there's any doubt about that from, from my reading of, the, uh, of the, the, the data. But this this was the precursor to that. What we're talking about here was the precursor to that and it was really about what happened in the Crimean War. And the Crimean War itself is, is very famous. It's written about extensively. Uh, it was a war in which the British and French supported the Ottoman Empire, the, the Turkish Empire, or, or not really Turkish, uh, but uh, against Russian expansion in the Balkans. But of course, the British and French had their own agendas, and they were worried about Russian expansion in the world more generally and were, were very keen to, to push the Russians back. The British in particular were concerned about Russian activity in Afghanistan and felt that if they engaged the Russians uh, in round about the Balkans, then that would pull the Russians out of Afghanistan and, and give them more breathing space. They thought initially that the, the combat would take place in what is now Bulgaria and Romania, but the, the action quickly shifted to the Crimea. So the British Expeditionary Force went first to Varna on the Black Sea coast in what is now Bulgaria. Uh, 
uh, and then uh, later moved to the, the Crimea. The Crimea is that lozenge shaped peninsula that sticks down into the Black Sea from southern Russia and is currently disputed between Russia and the Ukraine. So it's a very famous war and there's famous episodes and this this uh, painting here is the charge of the light brigade which was a, a kind of uh, kind of military madness uh, in which orders appear to have been deliberately misinterpreted to allow uh, a heroic charge into the Russian cannons and that's that's the kind of thing that, that became very public during the war. The, the war was heavily reported. It was one of the first wars to receive uh, lots of media attention. There was lots of reporters there. And this incident obviously became very famous. And and another thing that was very famous, of course, was Florence Nightingale as, as the lady with the lamp in the hospitals in, uh, not in the Crimea so much. Uh, she did visit the Crimea, but she was mostly based in Scutari, which is in modern day Turkey. So the conditions of the war were, were particularly problematic. There was typhus, dysentery, cholera that had all set into the army before its departure from Varna. So before any fighting had actually taken place, these diseases were starting to work their way through the army. And it was having an effect on troop numbers even before the fighting began. The, uh, the British and French commanders both died of, of uh, the fevers. And uh, of course, they're completely indiscriminate. So they were taking out people left, right and centre. And the conditions in the uh, in the war and, and particularly in the war hospitals were reported by Thomas Chenery in the Times and he wrote a series of very scathing articles about the conditions. And this was obviously uh, came to the attention of the British public. There was a bit of an outcry about uh, about the, the conditions that the troops were suffering and Florence Nightingale went out with a party of nurses in 1855 and, and I could talk extensively about how that happened, but she, she was very well connected. She knew Palmerston and uh, Sidney Herbert and many other, you know, really high ranking politicians of the time. And she was able to leverage this ability to go out to the to the Crimea. In the hospitals themselves, the conditions were absolutely appalling. There was uh, serious overcrowding as the troops became sick. The numbers of, of troops in the hospitals just ramped up and ramped up until they were just crammed into every space. There was a, a serious shortage of provisions and general medical supplies. There was, of course, no real understanding of the causes of disease. Uh, at this time, the, uh, the prevailing sense was of a, a miasmatic uh, infection which came from bad air, from rotting vegetation. And uh, there was very poor hygiene in the hospitals generally, and the, the mortality rates were, were really quite horrific. And during the war itself, the, um, the army uh, hierarchy weren't really interested in the hospitals. They weren't interested in the sickness of the troops. They were only really interested in the efficiency of the army. So they wanted to know uh, how many uh, of the of the troops were available for action and the doctors would report uh, how many were in hospital and how many were, were fit for action and that that was it. that was the extent of the concern unless of course that that number became obviously out of control in which case the um in which case there would be some response, but somehow the doctors seem to have managed that so that it never really became an issue of concern that allowed army hierarchy to look at the medical practice and say there's something wrong here. The the medics themselves were were badly organized because of the army hierarchy. The army was organized into regiments. Every regiment had its own hospital, so there was no central hospital provision. There was no medical hierarchy within the within the army. Each each regiment had its own medical provision. The hospital at Scutari, where Florence Nightingale was based, was an unusual general hospital where troops were coming from all over. That that was really quite an unusual thing. But most of the uh, most of the best qualified doctors who were working in the army 
were actually spending most of their time struggling with, with army red tape, producing the reports that the army wanted them to produce, that the bureaucracy was horrendous, delivering uh, all kinds of uh, information that really didn't allow them to, to get to work with the patients. This meant that in practice it was the, the dressers and the orderlies and, and often the nurses who were actually doing much of the medical work on the ground. The casualty rates were really, really frightening at times. Uh, at one point during the, the winter of 1855, the, the death rate in the Scutari Hospital was 90%. So if you went into the hospital, you had a 90% chance of dying. And there are lots of anecdotes, uh, stories about, you know, people who, like a travelling salesman who was travelling through Turkey and decided that uh, perhaps the safest place for him to spend the night was with the, the British Army in the hospital at Scutari, and he caught fever and died. And he was just passing through. So, you know, it was an extremely hostile environment. Uh, but it did improve. It did improve in uh, after that winter of 1855, uh, 1854 to 55, a sanitary commission was sent out from the UK. Florence Nightingale had written extensively to, to Palmerston and Sidney Herbert and others and said, look, we need to help here. And so a sanitary commission was eventually sent out and they began to clean up the hospitals. And massive improvements in recovery rates, massive improvements in uh, sickness rates resulted because they, they simply introduced hygiene into the system. And, and of course, the, the impact was, was great. So that's, that's kind of what happened in the war. And then what happened after the war, or well, actually during the war and after the war, is that there were a number of investigations. The, the reporting on the war was, was so extensive and so critical and was causing so much uh, anxiety amongst the British public that there were a large number of investigations that happened both during and after the war. So four commissions of inquiry took place on site in the Crimea or you know, in the, in the war zone during the war itself. And then a parliamentary committee and a board of inquiry were also held in London during the war. So, so no less than six, six inquiries were held into the war while it was happening. Uh, and then immediately after the war in 1856, there was another parliamentary inquiry that he heard a lot of uh, evidence from doctors uh, about medical grievances but mostly what the doctors were concerned with at that time was their remuneration. Uh, and, and so it, it, th there was evidence about the conditions, but really it was about them saying, we're not getting paid enough to do this. So uh, the senior doctors who'd been in charge of the larger hospitals and, and you know, the, the army medical service, such as it was, were very defensive about what had happened in the Crimea. They denied that there were major problems and they used statistics to show reasonable outcomes. And, and so in all of these inquiries, nothing really happened. But Florence Nightingale and a number of other people, including medical people, after the war lobbied successfully for a more wide ranging commission, uh, which eventually reported in 1858. And this is the this is the title of it here. The report of the commissioners appointed to inquire into the regulations affecting the sanitary condition of the army, the organization of military hospitals and the treatment of the sick and wounded. Uh, so it, it had one of these typically catchy titles of these parliamentary reports. Florence Nightingale was really the star witness in this thing. And when she came to give her evidence, there was an initial attempt, uh, briefly, to try and deflect from what happened in the Crimea, because the evidence actually came from a, a wider set of, of conflicts. And uh, there, there was an attempt by uh, members of the co committee to say, do we really need to talk about the Crimea? Because it's been talked about so much. And she said, uh, we have more information on the sanitary history of this Crimean campaign than we have on any other. It's a complete example history does not afford its equal, of an army after a great disaster arising, arising from neglects, having been brought into the highest state of health and efficiency. It is the whole experiment on a colossal scale. In all other examples, the last step has been wanting. 
to complete the solution of the problem. Is this not is not this the most complete experiment in army hygiene? So she presented it as a model of it had gone wrong, but we managed to fix it. And that was the, the crux of the evidence. We managed to fix it. She argued that the basic problem had always been sanitation. And you've got about five minutes, Bill. Five minutes, OK, yeah, well, not too far away, actually. She argued that the basic problem had been sanitation. And uh, they, they had gathered, she, she and others had gathered evidence from a number of different sources and they combined it together because none of the none of the records that were being kept really told the whole story. So she'd been keeping records about the, the patients in the hospitals. Doctors had been keeping uh, treatment records. Uh, the mortuaries had been keeping records about the causes of death and so on. So they, they gathered all this information together and it wasn't Florence Nightingale that was primarily responsible for this, but she did use it. It was, it was in fact, uh, a, a clinician. And they gathered all this evidence together and they were able to show very compellingly what had happened. And uh, it, it created visibilities about the, the problems that just hadn't really been seen before. She argued extensively that all the previous considerations on um, on the, on the uh, Crimean disaster had been based on very poorly constructed evidence and she spent a long time in this uh, commission giving a long lecture on statistical method and, and giving uh, reference to that she'd drawn this from the best statistical sources. And this is where William Farr came in. They'd worked on this on this stuff together. And you can see here that, uh, you know, she's, that she's working through evidence. She's showing how by this method and by that method, we can look at these things and eventually we arrive at the correct method to, to show these things. Um, after that, there was a relentless flow of evidence that completely demolished the, all the prior assertions that there, were, there wasn't really a serious problem in the Crimea. The evidence showed lots of tables. There's a great quote in a, a great uh, line in Dickens Hard Times about Victorian tabulations. And as, as Gradgrind comes back from the school and, and starts to write down a new table about the boy's behaviour and, and so on, he, you know, and Dickens talks about it, you know, becoming another table that flows into the stream of tables that flows into the great river of tables that exists in Victorian society. And it's that kind of thing. Everything is tabulated and the, the, the evidence is just overwhelming in its volume. And it goes on for hours. I don't know how long she was actually in, in these meetings, but it must have been days. You know, it goes on for hours and hours, <clears throat> thousands and thousands of words of evidence. And uh, the data was uh, often couched in terms of efficiency and was really showing how the army had been seriously weakened by the loss of troops to the conditions and showing how, you know, looking at things like how often the army had to be replaced in its entirety uh, as a result of the of the health conditions had they not managed to fix it. And then, and I think this was really the killer blow, and this was based on data that William Farr had been able to supply because as Deputy Registrar General, he had the UK uh, death rates. They showed that the, uh, the, the army sanitation was actually so poor that even troops in the barracks at home suffered higher death rates than normal people in, in the country. So we've got, uh, on this table you can see on the right, we can see that uh, Englishmen of ages 20 to 25 suffer 8.4 deaths per thousand uh, annually to, to the thousand living, whereas the soldiers were 17. And that's obviously a, a huge difference. And so I, I know these numbers look a bit strange, but it, it relates to the way that they, they prepared the data. Uh, and so the point was made that actually the army is selecting the fittest people. They're selecting healthy young people. And so their death rates should be lower than the general population. And, and really, um, that's not the case. Obviously, they're twice as bad. And and that was really, really 
showing just how poor the ar army was in terms of its organisation, its sanitary, its care of the people who, who were there. And the result uh, of this was that the there were extensive reforms, not just of, of army hospitals, but of the army more generally. And I'd, I'd love I'd love to talk more about that in particular, and and I will in the paper, uh, but I'll, I'll probably stop there. But that's that's the story. That's broadly what happened. And so, uh, thanks for listening. <laughs> and uh, if anyone's got any comments or questions, I'd love to hear them. Uh, so, anything you want to say is most welcome. Well, th thank you, Bill, for a, a, fas a fascinating paper and. Um, what I will do is I will invite people to put their hands up to ask.